Righty ho, so let's look at At Castle Bottrell by Thomas Hardy. Now, a couple of things for you to remember. There's a lot in this that you can relate to your AO for your biographical contextual information. So this poem was written by Thomas Hardy after his wife Emma's death. Remember, Emma died in 1912 and this poem is written, um, or sorry, was written in March of 1913. So not quite a year after her death. <clears throat> and in this poem, Thomas Hardy tries to recapture a moment of supreme happiness that he had with Emma at this place here, Castle Bottrell. Um, a place that he and Emma had visited when they were just boyfriend and girlfriend, when they were courting. Um, perhaps a place where they had gone to discuss the idea of being engaged, the idea of maybe getting married later on, which of course they did. But remember, their marriage was an unhappy one. It started off happy, but they grew um, more and more apart. He then wrote about the woes in his marriage in the novel Jude, Jude the Obscure. Emma took the criticism within that novel um, relating to marriage to be a criticism of her and her actual marriage with Thomas. And because of that, they were estranged for the last 10 years of her life. Remember um, Thomas Hardy's um, lovely little secretary, Florence, who he knew because obviously she was his secretary, who Emma knew as his secretary did in fact become Mrs Thomas Hardy in 1913. So in amongst all this woe and all this sorrow and grief, uh, you have the idea that Thomas Hardy also was married that year too, married in 1913 to Florence, the lovely secretary. So we've got a poem here about grief, about regret, about lost opportunities, and it's a romantic poem, but there's this part to it, this side to it, an interpretation to it that perhaps makes you view it not so much as a romantic poem but more a poem where the speaker focuses on his um, feelings, his emotions more than those of, of the loved one, the figure of Emma. So let's go and see what we can make out of it. Now as you see <laughs> I've scribbled all over this. <laughs> but here you have the lovely Emma um, before she was married. Um, there she is, very elaborate hairdo. She looks great, a bit serious, I suppose. Uh, and there's Emma. And that is the, the figure, that girlish figure that um, the speaker sees again once more on the hill at Castle Botra. So remember, she died in 1912. And in 1913, when the poem was written, um, Hardy began a series of poems about emotion, about that di idea of dealing with grief. And he continued that for the next decade. You know, I, he didn't die until, I think, 1928. And so he continued for the next decade to write these poems about grief and loss, despite the fact that he's got his new hot wife, Florence, um, helping him there with his grief and his loss. Now, also throughout the poem, we have the idea of um, mythical illusion. And the allusion here is to the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. And there's the lovely Orpheus and there's the lovely Eurydice. And um, we'll go to the next slide and I'll talk about Orpheus and Eurydice a little bit more and then the, how that illusion works. Okay, so in the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, the bit that we are interested in is the idea that Orpheus and Eurydice were deeply in love with each other. And again, you have that, you know, at the very start... During their courtship, during the first years of marriage, Thomas and Emma were in love as well. However, Eurydice, she dies and she's taken to the underworld, which is the Greek version of, of um, well, not hell, because everybody went to the underworld, but um, she's taken there anywhere, anyway, because she's dead and that's what happens. And Orpheus just couldn't live without her. And so he goes to um, the underworld and he asks the king of the underworld, please, please, can I have Eurydice back? I love her so much. And his wish is granted that he can take Eurydice back to the land of the living. The only thing he has to remember is that he must lead and Eurydice must follow. And uh, Orpheus is not to look back at any point. Just trust that Eurydice will be following him back into the light. Um. And of course, off they go and they do that. And just 
just at the point, it's always just at the point where they're nearing the end of the journey, but just at the point where they're reaching the mouth of the cave, he wanted just to check on Eurydice, so he turned back to look at her, to have this last look. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a last look because Eurydice disappeared. Um, as soon as he turned back to look at her, um, she disappeared and she was lost to him forever. Never more could he uh, recapture that love. And therefore, you have that idea of this figure um, disappearing from sight in Castle Bottrell that can never, ever be conjured up again. That figure that, that um, once that figure has disappeared, the love has gone too, the moment has gone, and all that you're left with is a sense of loss. And that's what we have here in this poem. Bit of a bad end there to Orpheus. Um, he got his head uh, torn off by the women of Thrace because he wouldn't give them smooches. And his poor little head kept singing all the way down to the sea, as you do. Okay, so let's look first of all at stanza one. As I drive to the junction of the lane and highway, and the drizzle bedrenches the wagonette, I look behind at the fading byway, and see on its slope, now glistening wet, distinctly yet. Right, first of all folks, let's look. You've got that eye. Now, throughout this poem, what you have is is this idea of the, the isolation of the speaker. It starts the poem, it ends the poem, but in the stanzas in between, that isol isolation is lost for a while because he connects again with the, sh the, the figure on the hill. He connects again with the figure of the loved one. So it begins with the isolation as I drive. And that isolation perhaps is furthered by the use of the present tense. It's it's that idea that it's it's not past isolation. It's what he's coping with at this moment in time. So as I drive, you've got present tense. Immediately we're firmly in the present. And not only are we firmly in that present, but it's an unhappy pre pre present. It's a present of isolation. And look there at the pathetic fallacy there. Pathetic fallacy of the drizzle be drenching so the wet sodden rain with the isolation of the pronoun i gives you this the idea of the loneliness the melancholy melancholy the melancholy of, of this opening stanza so the tone is melancholic you have a sense of the po the speaker's isolation then you have this here I drive to the junction of a lane and highway. Now, what we have here is a metaphorical junction and an actual junction. So physically, it's at the junction of, of this lane and highway. But also, it works as a metaphor. A metaphor between the present, which we're currently in, and the past, where we're going to retreat to. So you've got the metaphor between past and present. And that present is, is a lonely um, sorrowful, isolated place, whereas the past is a place of love and connection and intimacy. As the drizzle bedrenches the wagonette, I look behind at the fading byway. Now, if if you see there, folks, you've got this idea again, present tense with the verb look at the fading byway and see on its slope now glistening wet distinctly yet. Now, look at that couplet there, that full rhyme of wet and yet. And if if you listen to this line and see on its slope now glistening wet distinctly yet, you've got s s s s. You've got the sibilance there. So what we have is we've got sibilance, we've got the full rhyme of the couplet, and the enjambment because we've got this stanza leading straight into the next. And those three things together, the sibilance, the full rhyme of the couplet and the enjambo, they create this idea of pace and eagerness, an eagerness to get to the next stanza, an eagerness to get to what he sees on the slope and see on its slope now glistening wet distinctly yet. Now we don't know what it is that he sees, but there's an eagerness to get there. So what we have here is we've got a sense that the, the, the present is an isolated, it's a melancholic place, and yet there's something happening, something developing, which we will know is this move to the past. 
which he's eager to get to. So the, that increase in pace, which you've got with the sibilance, with the full rhyme, and also with the enjambo, what that does is it creates an eagerness to get back to that moment in time, to in experience that sheer joy that he had in the past. So let's see what it is that he's eager to get to. Distinctly yet myself and a girlish form benighted in dry March weather. Now here we have folks a repetition of something that we've seen in the first stanza. Again in the first stanza we had I and it was isolated and here we have my so again the idea of the speaker being first but not not in a way that is there to enhance his isolation but to suggest that there's a connection that there is some sense of intimacy here myself and a girlish form benighted in dark or sorry in dry march weather so he's connected to a girlish form now that's an important point because it's not Emma as she was when she died in 1912, but Emma as she was when they were courting in the 1870s. So it's a retreat back to a time of innocence. Innocence for, oh, hold on a minute, hold on. Sorry, just my little girl there. Okay, so what we were talking about, yeah, innocence. So this idea of the girlish form, um, a, a time of a time before everything was jaded, before everything went wrong. And so we have a connection with the speaker in this girlish form. And look, in dry March weather. So even though they're benighted, even though it's a dark um, a dark scene that he's seen, so a nighttime scene that he's seen, even though there, that is uh, there, you've got that idea that this is a time, it's dry, it's March, spring, and it's connotations of hope. Again, linking to that idea of innocence before everything goes wrong. Um, myself in a girlish form benighted in dry March weather. And then um, as, if to, as if to contradict the first two lines of stanza one, we climb the road beside the chase. We had just alighted to ease the sturdy pony's load when he sighed and slowed. So, slowed rather. so what you have there is that lovely connection again through the pronouns. We climb the road um, beside the chase. We had just alighted. So it's as if they're in that moment again. We climb, we're living that moment. Um, also then you have the idea of to ease the sturdy pony's load when he sighed and so slowed. It's very hard to say that. And here you have sibilance again, but the sibilance isn't <clears throat> to create pace. Here the sibilance slows down that pace. Um, what it allows the speaker to do then is to enjoy the moment, to enjoy the moment that he has here, that he's recreated. We had just alighted to ease the sturdy, the sturdy pony's load when he sighed and slowed. Isn't that so hard to say? But that idea that he can enjoy that. And what we have here with those long voile sounds then too, it's just lengthening that, lengthening the, the moment because what the speaker wants to do beyond all is to relive that moment for as long as he can. A moment which um, is immense in terms of its quality, not its quantity, not its length. Spurious point if you want to make it about the idea of how Hardy really was um, very much an animal lover and of course getting out of the, uh, out of the chase, out of the little wagonette to ease the burden on the pony would have been something that would very much be in, in his nature. But hey, let's not bother with that. We'll just throw it in there. Okay, folks, so let's look at this stanza. Now, in this stanza, Hardy does something um, which perhaps seems quite strange. He immediately dismisses the importance of, of what they did and what they talked about. Um, now, at this point, what we believe... Um, Hardy is alluding to is the fact that they talked about marriage and in a 19th century context marriage is so important it's the foundation stone of you know the of society um girls grew up with the only aspiration to to be a good wife and mother and therefore 
to dismiss something that society sees as so important is quite ironic. And we have that here with the ironic tone of Hardy when he says, it doesn't matter. You know, what we talked about, what we did, that doesn't matter. And then you have this dismissal of, of perhaps the fact that they, it, it was an engagement that happened here, that they talked about marriage and what it led to, it led to that marriage. That doesn't matter either. Um, in fact, you have this deliberate understatement that if it were the engagement, if it was the moment where they talked about marriage, none of that matters. What matters was that moment, the quality of joy within that moment. And so again, it's this idea that Hardy is taking a view, which is quite ironic, which is contrary to what society in the 19th century context would have seen as important. Um, you've got the idea of the, the totes there. It matters not much. It's deliberately understated, nor to what it led. And what you have there as well, after the word led, is you've got that caesura, that dramatic pause for you, for the speaker, to think about what it led to. What did that talk lead to? Did it lead to marriage? And then the importance of that marriage in relation to the sorrow that it brought. Um, how wrong things went in the, the latter uh, stages of that marriage. And then what you have here with that dramatic pause is you've got a moment, a little break, where Hardy gives you his view on, on what it was that they had talked about marriage itself. Something that life will not be balked of, that life will not deny without rude reason till hope is dead and feeling fled. And here, folks, people have talked quite a lot about the nature of this talk. And they believe that this was the moment where they did discuss marriage. And Hardy then tells you very clearly how much he denounces the state of marriage, how he sees it as something that creates misery. And in 1912, Hardy said in the Hearst magazine, uh, magazine article that's quoted here, the English marriage laws are the gratuitous cause of ha at least half the misery of the community. And you have that idea, idea of marriage causing misery with the full rhyme of that couplet again, dead and fled. And you've got those hard D signs. So you've got the consonants of those hard full D signs of without rude reason till hope is dead and feeling fled. And what it does is it creates that idea of marriage focused solely with negativity. Ooh, looks a bit weird at the end, but sure you know what I mean. Um, and here we have that idea that you can bring in the A4, that the, the idea of it doesn't matter whether this was the point where they were talking about engagement, because in Hardy's view, the marriage laws of, of England were there to cause misery, and it certainly did cause misery in his life. By the time uh, we got to 1912, he and Emma were n no longer living together in any um, shape or form as a husband and wife. Their relationship had broken down completely, um, and their, their marriage was a miserable existence for both of them. Okay, now... This stance is really important but because what it does is it repeats the theme of this poem. And the theme is the idea of quality versus quantity. The quality of that moment makes it uh, priceless. And here you have that nice simple sentence, it filled but a minute. And if you look here, what we have Hardy um, doing is that he's using the idea of juxtaposition. He's using the temporal idea of that one moment. It's ephemeral. It, it lasts but a moment and then it passes. And then he's juxtaposing that with the idea of longevity. Was there ever such a minute in that hill story? Now, a hill story would last millennia. You know, you have this idea of the, the perpetuity of the landscape. It's longevity. And it's juxtaposed with this lovely temporal moment, this ephemeral little moment that they had. But just because it lasts, um, you know, just, at la just because it lasts merely seconds doesn't mean that it wasn't wondrous, more wondrous than anything that might be there for, for weeks or years or months. And, and that's what Hardy's doing. That's how he's challenging maybe social judgments with this poem, because what he's saying is it is the quality 
of that feeling rather than the longevity of that feeling that matters. It was the quality of that moment rather than the fact that we discussed then getting married that what ma- is that is what matters. And you have that again backed up too with the use of the hyperphora. Was there ever such a time or was there ever a time of such quality since or before in that hill story to one mind ne- never? So he asks the question and then what he does having asked the question is he um answers it again. So hold on, let me write hypophora for you here. Just got, oh, there we go. Um, and then again, you've got juxtaposition two. Uh, to one mind never, though it has been climbed, foot swift, foot sore by thousands more. So again, we're juxtaposing the experiences of one mind, the experience of one mind with the experience of thousands. And again, what he's putting forward is the idea of quality versus quantity. The experience of the two people is contrast, contrasted with the experience of thousands and comes off the better for it. Um, it is an elevation of that tiny moment where everything was supreme, where everything was wondrous, where nothing ever, it was peerless, um, it was inimitable, it could not in any way be beaten by anything, no matter how long you search for something to um, to equate with it, you would never find it. A highly romanticised notion of, of, of the experience that he had there. Okay, in this stanza then, um, Hardy continues with his idea of quantity versus quality. And he begins with the idea of the grandiose image of, I suppose, the universe and of the earth. Primeval rocks form the road's steep border, and much have they faced there first and last. So again, what he's talking about here is perpetuity, longevity. The idea that these rocks have seen much, that they've been there first and last. You know, they've been there, there from the, the very first moments of the earth and they'll be there to the very last moments. So the longevity of, these ge- of this geographical landscape is made very clear. And then that longevity is contrasted with this tiny little moment that passed so very quickly. So what we have here is you've got this clash between the universal and the timeless. And you have that clashing with the personal and the ephemeral. And it's the personal and the ephemeral that wins, not the universal and the timelessness. For him, the most important, the most beautiful thing was the idea that they were just there together, that they had that moment together. Not the fact that these roads or that these rocks have been there for millennia and will be there when we are all dead and buried. That doesn't matter. What does matter is that we too passed. And again, that connection is repeated, that we too, the, the, the idea that they were there together. So what we have in, in this um, stanza is again the reiteration of, of his statement made in the previous, that it is the quality of the moment, not the quantity that matters. And here, this image um, of, of the landscape, it's panoramic. If you um, have the idea that we can see not only the landscape in front of us, but what, what has been there for generations, what has been there for millennia, what will continue to be there. And yet, that is not as great or as glorious or as important as the temporal nature of the human life and that temporal moment that they had, that they were there. But what you notice here is that it's that we too passed, that we were there, but we're not there any longer. They have the idea of the past tense, that this movement away from from reliving that moment to understanding that that moment has gone. And there is a there is a sense of sorrow here that even though even though that moment was so great and glorious and can compete with the universal and timeless, it's a moment that passed that is is retreating, and that then is an image that is seen further in stanza six. 
Now, in this stanza, I think the first thing that you see is the idea of the personification of time. Time's unflinching rigour, the mindlessness of time. And time here personified as an enemy. A harsh, unfeeling enemy. An enemy who is there to, to attack in an uncaring, unthinking way the beauty of those moments that, that we can share in our lives. And so time's unflinching rigour in mind as wrote has ruled from sight the substance now. So even though even though that, that idea of this, the actuality of it, the substance, has gone, there remains the shadow of that moment. There remains the, the tiny little vestige of it that he can hold on to. So there's a real sense of negativity in this stanza. So the tone is much more negative in this stanza than it was perhaps in the preceding one. And you have the idea that there's a sense of detachment from the past what is left is not the substance but a phantom and again there's a sense of weakness there that the the oh can't fit weakness in that the emotion that was so strong that was even though it lasted such a tiny amount of time it was so strong that it could compete with millennia of emotions experienced by thousands of other people there is a sense here that it's becoming weakened one phantom figure remains on the slope and there you have your allusion to the orpheus and eurydice myth of that phantom figure on the slope the phantom figure of eurydice when orpheus looks back before it disappears and what we have then is the lover is now a phantom and the words that she that the, the word phantom gives you that idea that she's become a shadow that the vitality of that experience that emotion that lasted but a minute but was so strong, that is something that's becoming less and less. It's being diluted by time. But time doesn't care. Time is unflinching. It's mindless. It doesn't care that it attacks such emotions and such memories. And what you have then also too is the idea that um, to me, to him, these are his feelings. It's all related back to, to his experience, the speaker's experience. Um, and to his sense of sorrow, to his sense of um, isolation, to his sense of grief, that this beautiful, wonderful moment is something that is gone. The substance has gone um, and only a, a tiny shadow of it is left. In the final stanza, there are a couple of things that have returned. The isolation of the pronoun I and the present tense. When we looked at stanza one, we saw that those two things created this melancholic, sorrowful tone. And we're back to that melancholic, sorrowful tone. So the poem is in some ways cyclical. It's not as if the speaker has worked through the emotions that he uh, began the poem with and has then emerged with some sense of cathartic um, closure. That's not happened. What we have is the fact that despite the, the journey that he's undertaken back into the past to try and relieve that moment, he hasn't in any way improved his situation. If anything, his situation is worse by the time we get to the final stanza because you've got this sort of fatalism. Um, it's fatalistic in tone. Death is waiting for him and it comes through in the imagery and we'll talk about that in a minute. So... What we have here, I look and see it there shrinking, shrinking. So what's the it? The it is that phantom figure. Now, the fact that we're talking about the phantom figure, Emma, the loved one, as an it, does that devalue it? Perhaps it does. It's not she. I look and see her there. No, it's not that. It's I look and see it there. And perhaps that use of the pronoun could be seen as devaluating or do, as a way of um, devaluing the person, the, the, the connection. And one of the things you have to think about in this poem is, is it about the love he feels for that person? Is it about the person? Or is it about how he felt at that moment, which then is about his feelings, not about hers? Is it about the connection between two people? Or is it about how he felt at that moment? 
because if it's about how he felt, if this is all about him, then that might perhaps be a little bit less romantic than you per maybe see this poem as, as being when you initially read it. So I look and I see it there shrinking, shrinking. I look and I see that image um, shrinking, shrinking. And the repetition of shrinking, shrinking, um, again, just reiterates this idea of weakness. And the idea of the speaker as passive, there's nothing that he can do to change the situation because time is the enemy and time does not allow these things to last. I look behind at it admit the re amid the rain, again repetition of the use of it there, devaluating perhaps the, the, the image itself, and back to the rain, back to the pathetic fallacy and to the misery and the sorrow that we had there in the opening stanza. For the very last time. Now, you've got that use of the semicolon there, which creates a pause. Um an idea that this image, that this emotion is something that is ending and cannot continue. And that pause there that you get, the caesura that you get for that semicolon, re just em emphasises that, reiterates that, the pause that this feeling of reliving that moment can no longer continue. And then you have this lovely illusion, this metaphor of the end of life. For my sand is sinking and the poet there, the speaker is using the idea of the, the um, you know, the wee egg timer, the wee sand timers that you see. And there's all your sand up there. And then slowly and surely it all sinks to the bottom. And when it gets to the bottom, then you have no sand left. Teddy bread dead. So we have this metaphor for his uh, life that my sand is sinking. He feels near death. He feels this weakness, this weakness within himself. And I shall traverse old love's domain never again. Look at that emphatic statement there, never again. And it's borne out by the syntax of the, um, of the line, that the line stops at domain and starts here with never again. Just those two words together. It sounds a bit like a tolling bell, doesn't it? It really creates this idea that he feels death is, is near at hand. And what we have here is it's creating an atmosphere, a moribund, a near-death atmosphere. Uh, the tone is definitely one that is, is linked to fate, um, you know, fatalism and the, the idea that, that death is, is lurking. But when you think about it, it's March 1913, which isn't the case because he gets married that year and he lives for another 15. So perhaps there it sounds dramatic, it sounds romantic, but it also might sound a little bit insincere. It's really up to you in terms of how you interpret that, that I shall traverse all love's domain never again. Um, all of those things are, are, are linked to the idea of his experiences again he is there at the heart of everything. If you look at all of those stanzas, how many of them have I as as their first word or, or if not first, their second. So it's his experiences at the heart of it rather than their shared experiences, rather than her. Um, he takes precedence in, in this poem. And one of the things that you need to think about in relation to that is um, this is a poem about isolation and love and grief and sorrow it never moves on from that there's there's no there's no way that love and that moment is redemptive um it doesn't change for him but if you think about the AO4 if you think about what was happening in Hardy's life then you can see that yes he didn't traverse old love's domain never again but he did traverse new love's domain. He got married that year. Um, and, and that might be something perhaps that you'd like to bring into your interpretation of the poem. So when we think about the poem, tonally then, you've got that isolation and negativity at the very start. Then it moves in stanza two and stanza three towards that understanding or wonder really of how, how beautiful that moment was. He tries to rationalise it and justify it. He tries to make the negativity uh, or he tries to hold the negativity at bay. However, it comes back. Time won't allow that emotion or that moment to live on for very much longer. And the negativity comes in at stanza five and stanza six 
And then in this final stanza, you've got this idea that he's saying farewell to, to this image, farewell to that part of his life, farewell to the beauty of that moment. And one way of saying that is that the poem is in some ways a valediction, a piece written to say farewell to, can you see that? Probably not. I'll write it down here. That doesn't really help you, does it? <laughs> Hold on. There, I'll try it again. There, valediction. Um, he's trying. Uh, it's a, a way of saying farewell to, to that beautiful moment that he knows he can never experience again. And there's a pessimism to the poem because of that. There really is. So finally, things to think about in relation to the poem. Um, think about memory. Think about the idea of how how we are separated from the past, how we can um, er, ever try to relive it. Is this a poem in which the speaker is idealising a moment because it's he's trying to punish himself or because he wants to wallow in the sorrow of it? Or does that moment give him some comfort? And you have to think that, you know, that there is some comfort from that idea that when he says so emphatically, was there ever, was there ever a time in that Hill story to one mind never? Um, there's a, there, there must be some sense of comfort from that, at least. And then also, if you're thinking about this as a romantic poem, as a poem about the beauty and the love that he had for another person, then why is it all about him? You know, why is he so present in it? I, I, I. Um, Perhaps it's it's an idea of honouring that wondrous moment, but in in a viewpoint that is only about that one mind, his interpretation. And also too, as glorious and wonderful as that moment was, it did lead on to decades of marriage that were deeply unhappy by the time they got to the end. And is that not something that needs to be thought of too? I don't know, it's really up to you. But you can take this poem and you can connect it with Last Look, with James Heaney, the idea of the past. Or you could connect it to Heaney again with Blackberry Picking and, and the idea of disappointment. It's it's up to you. It's a toughie, isn't it? But your interpretation is as valid as anybody else's, as long as you use textual evidence to back it up. Okay.